بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. In the name of God, the most merciful, most compassionate. May the blessings of God be upon you all. Um, on behalf of the Arab Center, I would like to welcome you to the fifth annual Gulf Studies Forum. Uh, this forum, which started in December 2014, to be an academic forum to study the affairs of the Gulf region and its different uh, issues. and. Uh, Annually, a group of academics and experts are invited to discuss certain themes. In this fifth uh, annual studies, we can safely say that the forum has become an important platform for researchers from the Gulf and Arab regions and the world, in fact. We hope that uh, all uh, issues will be discussed, whether political, cultural, media, and uh, others. For this reason, we divided the forum into two themes, one of an internal nature and the second one of an international nature, and these are uh, constant themes uh, since 2014 four forums had been organized the first was general because it was uh, the first and we dealt with social economic and political affairs the second uh, session de dealt with education and its challenges the third dealt with economic diversification at the peak of the collapse of the oil prices. Last December, we covered the, the siege on Qatar in two themes. First, focusing on the media and the social media. The second theme dealt with the regional and international uh, stances vis-a-vis -vis the blockade which was imposed on Qatar. In this year's forum, we will continue in the same um, uh, manner, and uh, the internal theme will be dealing uh, with the identity and social transformations in the Arab Gulf states. Uh, the Gulf crisis has unveiled a certain conflict in the internal ties uh, between the Gulf countries at a time when many were of the opinion that uh, the entire GCC was one system compatible and the individual identities of each country have been emphasized strongly since the outbreak of this uh, crisis and the transformations and changes that all Gulf societies have gone through recently has been raising many challenges when it comes to the social uh, relations between different communities. This aspect will be dealt in 19 papers uh, divided on six uh, sessions dealing with the questions of identity and social transformations. As for the second uh, theme, which is uh, the relations between Gulf countries and the United States, which is considered as one of the most important determinants of uh, uh, life in the Gulf countries, consumerism, political aspects, economic cooperation, security issues. So, therefore, the bilateral relations between the GCC countries and that states will feature mainly in this theme. 
the relations between the United States and the Gulf really probably started with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, first followed by Kuwait and other Gulf countries once they gained their independence after the British withdrawal in the early 70s. This uh, theme will also be dealt with in six sessions with 19 papers uh, presented before the forum. Over the last four years, this forum has become uh, one of the important features for researchers uh, working for the Arab Center, in addition to researchers and scholars and experts from the region and the world who take part in the different sessions. More than 280 researchers uh, have taken part so far in this forum in its various uh, activities from social to political, economic, security, and other aspects. We thank you once again for attending this forum and wish you a pleasant stay in Doha. And may the blessings of God be upon you all. We start immediately with Dr. Gary Sek, who is a well-known scholar and probably one of the most important uh, in uh, uh, dealing with uh, the relations of the United States and he was a member of the National Security Council in the Carter Presidency. I invite uh, Dr. Gary Sek to present uh, his lecture. If nobody objects, I'm going to stay right here. Um, it's easier sitting down. Um, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for your kind invitation to participate in this group. I am very pleased to see so many old friends uh, here, some of whom I've already talked to and others I'm looking forward to seeing. Um, I am, um, I wrote a a fairly long paper. Uh, I am not going to bore you with it by going through it piece by piece, but uh, unlike a lot of academic uh, papers, uh, this one basically says almost everything that it has to say in the first paragraph. And uh, the uh, summary that you have, you haven't seen the whole paper, but the, the summary that you have in front of you uh, in, in the papers that have been distributed basically gives you the outline. Um, in a sense, this paper is the result of more than 50 years of watching the, the United States policy in the Gulf. And there won't be any real surprises, I think, for most of you who have watched this area as I have. Um, but I think it's packaged in a somewhat different way than you might be familiar with, and I'm looking at the facts in a slightly different way. So I would like to spend a short period of time describing to you what um, I think are some of the new or more controversial aspects of what I'm saying in the paper. And then <coughs> we're planning to allow a lot of time at the end for uh, discussion. And I'm hoping very much that you will uh, either challenge me on the points that you disagree with or perhaps uh, let me know what I left out or what I should have uh, included in this paper. With no further ado, let me uh, begin. Um, the this paper basically has an arc that goes from beginning to end, and that arc really runs from the point of the United States' very first discovery of the Gulf, the very first time that we came into contact with it, which was in the early 19th century, um, when the U.S. clipper ships came across the uh, 
the Indian Ocean and stopped particularly in Muscat. And as some of you know, uh, we have a treaty with Muscat of 1833, uh, which was uh, the first treaty that the United States had with any country in the region, and it still gets mentioned on national days uh, with the uh, country of Oman in particular. Um, that was our first introduction. Actually, the first U.S. military ships that arrived in the region were, uh, I believe, I'm correct, and I would love to be corrected if I'm not, if this isn't true, was a so-called Great White Fleet that uh, Teddy Roosevelt sent around the world to show that the United States was a becoming a major world power. Um, that fleet, interestingly enough, um, sailed across the Indian Ocean, and I think that must have been the first U.S. naval ships that uh, came through this region. Uh, curiously enough, from what I can tell from the accounts, uh, it started in Singapore and went to Suez without stopping at all. So uh, it didn't see any of you along the way. Um, but it was, uh, that was our first introduction to, to the region. The thinking about where we go from there, from this early stage of basically being unaware of the Gulf, we participated in the Gulf for any number of years. Um, I guess our, the high point was in World War II when the United States had about 30,000 troops in the region and it was there to support the supply lines running uh, to uh, the Soviet Union at that time in the during World War II. Uh, that was the largest number of military forces in the region from, our, from the U.S. point of view. Uh, from then until uh, basically the uh, Kuwait uh, war uh, against Saddam Hussein. The, uh, but those were not troops that were there for any other reason than just to keep uh, tabs on, what, on the uh, supply lines that were running through the, through the region. Uh, the reality is that for most of this time, the United States was not a major player in the region and really had no interest in becoming. It had interest in the region. It was begin beginning to be interested in oil and other things, but we were reliant on the British almost entirely. So the United States was a free rider, if you like, uh, on the British presence in the region, and we were uh, during that first 150 years of the, of the British rule. So really the story begins, as far as the United States is concerned, uh, in about 1971 when the uh, British announced their withdrawal from the region. And from that point on, uh, the, the United States was expected to become the, to, to basically step in and take the place of the British. And the, one of the things that my paper tries to point out, which I think is a little unexpected, is that we didn't rush to fill that vacuum. That basically the United States, instead of coming in to replace the British instantly, first tried to persuade the British to stay. Uh, we're quite happy with the relationship that we had with the British there as, our, as the protector. Um, and then when the British did pull out, the United States, uh, instead of coming in with its own forces, actually uh, stayed away and turned its interests over to two countries in the region to the uh, Iranians and to the Saudis as the dual protectors, the sort of twin pillar policy. This was the Nixon doctrine, which said that we're not going to always come in and do it ourselves. We uh, are going to instead let others uh, take that major role. And of course, it wasn't altruism or it wasn't a lack of uh, interest in the region we had interest in the region. We were concerned about the security. We were concerned about a possible Soviet uh, involvement in the region, and we wanted to prevent that. But we were very busy elsewhere at the time. We were in Southeast Asia and fighting a war, and there just weren't enough forces to go around. And the idea of the United States coming in and taking over a whole new section, or basically making a, for a major presence in an entirely new part of the world was something that didn't have very much appeal to the United States then. The th 
So the Nixon Doctrine basically provided U.S. answer to the, uh, the departure of the British. And we relied on Iran and Saudi Arabia for that intervening set of years for a variety of purposes. The, uh, the United States reduced its intelligence activities in the region. It uh, relied on the Shah for assistance in putting down the Marxist rebellion in Dofar. For an assured energy supply at the time of the oil uh, boycott in 1973, when the Shah secretly provided uh, a lot of oil to the United States during that period, and for support in a wide range of political and military operations that as far away as Vietnam, uh, where the Shah of, of Iran in particular was very uh, helpful to the United States in uh, its activities. So the collapse of the Shah's regime in February of 1979 was a major blow. It basically undercut the entire U.S. military security structure in the region and left us with no safety net. In fact, we had put all of our efforts in t into a relationship with a single man, the Shah, and when he went, uh, there was no, no plan B. There was no fallback position that was available to us. That, um, that led in turn to, and, and went along with a number of other things going on in the region at the time, but particularly the invasion of Afghanistan by the uh, Soviets, uh, which then led to the adoption of the uh, Carter Doctrine. Uh, and the Carter Doctrine was basically a statement which established a strategic framework for the United States uh, in the region. And I'm sure you're all familiar with it, but you know the words of it in the State of the Union Address in 1980, President Carter said, an attempt by any outside force to gain control of the Persian Gulf region will be regarded as an assault on the vital interests of the United States of America, and such an assault will be repelled by any means necessary, including military force. I would say that was the moment when the United States fully accepted, at least in theory, the full responsibility as being the protector of the Gulf. But it was actually still quite a long ways from reality. Uh, it, so that was American policy at the time, but American capabilities were very, very far away from having that capability. So it really then turned over to the Reagan administration, which came in uh, later to, in fact, put teeth into that policy. The Reagan administration adopted the Carter Doctrine without saying so. They didn't never call it the Carter Doctrine after they came in, but it was the same doctrine, it was the same policy, and actually has remained the same policy that every American administration has adopted since that time. But the uh, Reagan went ahead then and completed the job, which involved uh, a creating in 1983 a central command uh, force, which still exists, of course, for the United States, uh, and uh, had earmarked forces of some 230,000 military personnel from four different services. And today its forward operating headquarters is not very far from here uh, at Al Udaid Air Base uh, in Qatar. And the Fifth Fleet Naval Component, which was created in 1995, is based in Bahrain, as all of you know. Um, the, the beginning of the real entry of the United States into the Gulf, apart from some nice words, which were uttered by Carter and Reagan, really uh, was the Iran-Iraq War. Uh, so after Saddam Hussein invaded Iraq, invaded Iran uh, the, in 1980, uh, uh, the United States slowly got drawn in to the region in a very real way. And the, all of the doctrines that the United States had expounded up until that time always had to do with the danger of a, a threat from an outside force coming in and taking over the region. So we were basically worried about the Soviet Union. That was our principal concern. 
it turned out that the real threat to the Gulf was not from the outside. It was actually from a, an expansionist force within the Gulf itself, and this was in that particular case Saddam Hussein. And that uh, forced us to change our policy, though in fact it didn't make any difference as far as the words of the policy were concerned. Um, one of the things that I put some emphasis on in the paper was the U.S. decision to secretly provide arms to Iran in the course of the Iran-Iraq war. Uh, that is something which Americans find embarrassing to talk about because it was a complete debacle uh, from a policy point of view, but it had tremendous implications and, and repercussions for the United States and for the countries of the region. Basically, when the United States was caught uh, secretly selling arms to Iran when they had said that nobody should be selling arms to Iran, and, and it would looked as if the United States was prepared to change sides, which probably wasn't really true, but it certainly gave that impression. It meant that the United States, who had been resisting the calls of the Arabs to come in and basically participate more actively in the fight against Iran, um, and we'd been saying no uh, to those requests, suddenly we couldn't say no anymore uh, by having been caught, in effect, trying to do a deal with Iran, embarrassing ourselves, and showing that we were not a very reliable uh, ally uh, to the Arabs. So when the Arabs came to the United States after that and said, will you flag, uh, put your flag on ships going up and down the Gulf uh, to provide protection, we couldn't say no. And that was true for a number of things that happened later on, that we had to prove that we were a reliable ally, whether we were or not. And as a result, we got more deeply involved. And so starting really from that point, which was about 1985-86, the United States became much more actively involved. And by the end of the Iran-Iraq War, we had gone from being a neutral observer basically leaning toward the Iraqi side to actually joining the Iraqi side and the Arab side in the Gulf War. And by the end of that war, by, 1990, uh, yeah, by 1998, the United States was, uh, by eight, 1988, sorry, um, um, changed, um, the whole change of, of centuries has become a complication as far as I'm concerned. My mind is still back there. Um, but by 1988, by the end of the war, the United States had actually in, been involved in striking Iranian targets directly in the Gulf. We had hit a number of uh, places. We had sunk a sizable part of the Iranian naval fleet. Um, and we were actually a participant in that, what I would call a civil war in the Gulf. We had made ourselves a participant. We had, as, and when we decided to do that, it was taken as a temporary thing, as a measure that was involving only uh, a moment, like the, the reflagging of the ships was not regarded as a major change of policy. It was regarded as a relatively small event. But when you took on the job of supporting those ships, you also had to put in infrastructure, you had to bring in naval forces, you had to bring in uh, supporting forces of various sorts, and all of a sudden, permanent bases began to appear up and down the Gulf. The Arabs at the same time, who had always resisted the United States coming in. Kuwait wouldn't even let us come in for port visits uh, when I was a young naval officer at the, uh, in the in, in Middle East Force. Um, all of a sudden, it was Kuwait that was asking us to come in and set up a base there. Uh, everything changed. And so with that change, America's policies changed as well. And so the reluctance that I talk about in the title of this paper, America as the Reluctant Hegemon, uh, was not because we weren't interested in the region and it wasn't because we didn't have interests. It's because we didn't want to open an entirely new theater of, of operations. And this is really the history and the story of how we gradually were brought in. And one of the points that I make, which I think is obvious to all of you, but which is nevertheless, nobody else seems to be talking about it, is if you really want to understand why the United States 
came into the Gulf and why it is presently the hegemon in the Gulf, you really have to understand that it was the work of one man who did it, and that was Saddam Hussein. By invading Iran in 1980 and then invading Kuwait 10 years later, he basically created the circumstances in which the United States was drawn into the region, was forced to bring in military forces and set up uh, permanent military infrastructure in the region, and at the end of the day, when he was gone, uh, when, when he was basically defeated twice, uh, in he, was, he wasn't defeated in the Iran-Iraq War. He, it ended in a draw uh, for all practical purposes. Never was a peace settlement, but he certainly was defeated on the Kuwaiti War uh, in a very bad way. Uh, but in the meantime, the United States had built up a huge military infrastructure and that infrastructure, which was there because of Saddam Hussein, actually made it possible for George Bush to decide to invade Iraq, which was a mistake. Uh, it was not well prepared. We didn't really understand what we were doing, but we had the material capability of doing it because we had spent all of those years in the meantime building up a military structure that in fact made it possible for us to do that. He could never have made that decision to go in unless Saddam Hussein had conducted his two wars and we had a tremendous infrastructure of military bases and equipment available to us uh, at the time. I'm trying to keep track of time while I do this. Uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the, the uh, Second Gulf War, or for that matter, um, except to say that the United States, I think, in, in addition to some of the other mistakes that were made at that time, um, we, we had actually been calling for the, the Shia and the Kurds to rise up in Iraq and overthrow Saddam Hussein. And then when the war took place, we defeated Saddam. Uh, we had a settlement with Saddam, which unfortunately left helicopters in place in the hands of Saddam. He used those against those forces. And the Kurds and the Shia who had been given reason to believe that the Americans were supporting them, were abandoned uh, uh, without any, uh, without any, any qualms whatsoever by the Bush administration. And that was a very costly uh, affair, which again, left doubts about the United States as an ally. And I could go on to a great length about that. I do cover that in the paper, uh, as I cover all of these issues in a great deal of greater uh, uh, detail. Um, let me switch. After Saddam was defeated and the Cold War, in effect, was coming to an end, the Clinton administration came in just at that moment and had an opportunity then to define what American policy was going to be for the years to come. Uh, in a situation in which we had just won a war, the Cold War was over or was ending, uh, and basically it was up to the United States to decide what it was going to do. And what we chose was a policy called dual containment, which in fact um, was, I think, a policy which for all practical purposes is still in effect. It's only single containment now because it's been reduced to Iran, but it's the same policy, almost exactly. And that policy basically said that instead of our past policy of sort of balancing one power against another in the Gulf, with the Iran and Iraq in particular, that we now had the power to do it ourselves. We didn't have to worry about balancing one side against the other side. We were in a position of power where we could basically call the shots and we could basically carry it out ourselves. And we took on that responsibility. I think that was a mistake. Uh, I think that was uh, a, uh, an error a strategic error on our part, because what it did was basically say to the countries of the region, you don't have to worry about it. We'll take care of these bad guys for you. Uh, we don't expect you to have to do much of anything about it. You provide us with uh, access to bases and uh, military facilities in the region, and we want to cooperate with you, but we're not gonna call on you to do the heavy lifting, and the United States was going to be able, was going to pick that up and do it itself. Um, that 
concept that the United States was going to do it alone became embedded in the attitudes of the people of the region and in the United States for that matter. And uh, so this in effect was, uh, although nobody uh, calls it that, that, that really was the Clinton doctrine. And it was, it's really been in effect from then until the present. It has, I think, been pernicious uh, in the fact that it basically gave the impression that the United States was there to take care of all problems in the region and that other countries in the region didn't have to worry too much about that. That's an exaggeration, but I think that was the fundamental implication of the uh, policy. Uh, I won't go into great detail about 9-11 and the aftermath, though obviously that was tremendously important. Uh, George Bush's uh, invasion of uh, Iraq and Afghanistan at the time. Wars which are still going on in the region. The longest, uh, Afghanistan is the longest running war in American history um, and one of the least successful. Uh, but that decision, as I said before, would never have been possible if we hadn't had that long buildup uh, in terms of fighting Saddam Hussein. The Obama Doctrine, this is something that people don't call, uh, that isn't the name that you hear uh, attached to a doctrine uh, all that much, but President Obama did in uh, September of 2013 made an appearance at the UN General Assembly and in actually less than one page he outlined what is probably the most realist concept of American foreign policy that has ever been presented by a president. He said that the United States would do whatever was necessary to secure its own national interests, including intervention on behalf of allies who were threatened by external aggression, but the touchstone would be a cool appraisal of U.S. national interests. That's the, that is how it was formulated. And a lot of people picked up on that, but a lot of people really didn't. That, in effect, was the renunciation of what I called the Clinton Doctrine earlier, that the United States would do it all, that we would come in and take care of everybody's problems for them. Obama was saying, no, we're not going to anymore. That basically, you're going to have to be responsible for your own concerns. We will help, but we will help when it involves our national interests, and that's the way we will be looking at it. That was a huge shock uh, to the region. It, uh, I think it was inevitable. Uh, I think it was a mistake for the United States to take on the role that it had in the earlier years, but it was inevitable that that was going to change as time went on. And uh, Obama was trying to do this in a very gradualistic way, uh, so much so that a lot of people didn't even understand what was actually being said and what was actually going on. So Trump comes along. Um, basically having criticized President Bush for invading Iraq and praising President Obama for his unwillingness to escalate U.S. military operations in Syria. Trump's America First agenda was actually quite similar to the objectives of what I just called the Obama Doctrine in the sense that it would focus exclusively on U.S. core interests and on reducing America's footprint abroad. Uh, that was the promise, that was, the, and in fact, this, although I'm not a great fan of President Trump, I in fact agreed with this, and I thought that that was probably a pretty sensible policy, uh, depending on how you do it. The way he has gone about it, I think, has not been what I hoped for uh, along the way. But in some respects, what the Trump doctrine, America first, has really turned out to be is sort of a return to the Nixon Doctrine. That is, relying on the countries of the region to take care of the regional problems. Uh, and he's basically looking, in this case, to Saudi Arabia, the UAE to a lesser degree, and Israel, uh, creating a new alliance to basically take care of the, uh, the problems in the region, and the United States able to stand back away from these things uh, and uh, reduce its footprint along the way, though he doesn't stress that. A lot of people forget, and actually it hardly was even noticed, that during the whole previous Obama period, there was a U.S. carrier task force in and around 
the Gulf almost all the time. It was, uh, con it was considered to be almost a permanent fixture. And uh, we went six months this year without a carrier in the region, which the American media didn't pick up on, but I think is actually a significant factor that basically, although President Trump is making a lot of noise and making a lot of threats, in reality, his interests lie elsewhere and that he is going ahead with the same policies that the Obama administration was pursuing, the ones that w were making him so unpopular uh, in the region. Trump is doing it with a different rhetoric, but the same thing is happening. So my conclusion out of all of this uh, discussion, and this is, uh, as I say, a, a 6,000 word paper reduced to 15 minutes, um, is that the, the concept of America as the reluctant hegemon, we are the hegemon today, we have been uh, for a considerable period of time, but I'm arguing is just by the nature of things that is going to decline. That the United States footprint in the Middle East is bigger than it needs to be and is very, very expensive. Uh, by some standards, we have expended something like $6 trillion uh, on various activities in Afghanistan, Iraq, and elsewhere over the past, uh, what, 10, 15 years. An enormous uh, expense that has actually taken money away from everything else that the United States could or should have been doing at the time, that could not be sustained indefinitely. And I think what we're seeing is a very slow, gradual change. I do not see the United States picking up one day and walking away from the Gulf and saying goodbye, we're, gonna, we're not going to be here anymore. I do see, however, like the fact that all of a sudden there isn't a carrier present uh, all the time, that that there's a drawdown of some of the uh, bases, the numerous bases that exist all over this region. Some of them are being mothballed and put to, and, and gradually reduced in size. Uh, and that, of course, uh, goes with the fact that the wars that we've been fighting are basically uh, running down as well. So I see this as an almost inevitable process. Uh, I don't see us going back to zero, zero, but I don't see us staying anywhere close to where we have been in the Gulf over this long period of time. And if the United States really does pull back um, and reduces its footprint in the region, there are others who are waiting uh, to take our place. Uh, at this point, the Chinese are the free riders uh, in the region. They're free riding on us, just the way we did on the British, but they are also sitting there in the wings and waiting for their opportunity, and if that opportunity presents itself, I expect we will see them coming in, in a way. Uh, without going any further, let me stop at this point. I hope I've said a few things that would be controversial or thought-provoking, and I would very much be interested in hearing your questions or comments along the way, and I think we do have about 30 minutes to be able to do that. Thank you very much for this invaluable presentation about uh, this issue that is uh, gone through about 50 years. Uh, we have some time for questions, uh, about 20 minutes, uh, so we can take some of your questions. Uh, only questions, please, because of short time. Thank you, Gary. Uh, good to see you again. See you. Thank you for your excellent work with the Gulf 2000, which I've been a member since uh, 2000. Uh, uh, there are a couple of points. My paper fits nicely with your argument here about the, uh, the lack of trust or the crisis of trust with the United States. You have delineated a lot of uh, what you call mistakes but do you think that there are mistakes or there are blunders, especially the, the largest blunder, uh, blunder has been the tipping the balance off between the uh, Iran and Iraq by toppling Saddam Hussein and creating a huge vacuum that Iran benefited from it and uh, controlling now four Arab capitals with the uh, leading from behind uh, the, the Obama doctrine and the free rider. He accused us of a free rider. Who is the free rider at this stage? 
and you, you have concluded your, uh, your paper by arguing that we might expect the United States uh, less, lesser footprint. I call it abdication, not only in the Gulf, uh, the Arabian Gulf, but in the whole Middle East. The final point is that with the Trump administration and with his taunting and attacking and uh, lecturing all his allies, including Saudi Arabia, including us, what kind of uh, uh, strategy do you think the GCC countries uh, should have, considering that the Chinese are not going to be part of this uh, region for a long time? And even the Americans, they understand, and we know, and they know, they are the only kid in the block. There won't be another hegemoni hegemonic player or a powerful superpower coming in to take over United States, even with the less dependence of the United States on the, on the GCC oil. So what kind of uh, picture are we talking about, let's say, five years down the road? Shukran, Thank you. Dr. Uh, Abdullah. Hey, um, uh, I'll, I'll get two more questions. And okay, that's a very big question. Okay. But okay. Uh, okay. <coughs> well, thank you, Dr. Sik, for the uh, great historical account uh, of you know, the relation from the start till now. It's just that in throughout the narrative, you didn't mention Israel until the very, very end. Uh, wasn't the interests of Israel as an ally for the U.S. an important factor in some of the moves that the U.S. did, like, for instance, what happened in Iraq after the invasion of Kuwait? Uh, was it just a mistake to um, you know, enable Iran more, was it, or was it just an interest of Israel to sort of you know, destroy a, a potential enemy? So, I mean, I just didn't, in the whole narrative, I didn't see you mention Israel as much as I would have expected. Uh, I am General Mubarak Khairi. I have some questions about American policy in the region. One, we all know and we all sure that the American policy should pursue their their own interest and, and, and we have our own interest, so they are mutual interest, but our citizens and the peoples of the Gulf uh, do not trust US, the Americans. Uh, for example, the idea of the air base here in Qatar is to protect Qatar in terms of being a uh, uh, force, a uh, US force in the region. But after our late last uh, crisis, we all now know that the Americans uh, 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 did not uh, uh, help us to stop uh, a possible invasion to us by Saudis, uh, so we had to resort to the Turkey uh, to help us and to defend us. Uh, so there is a lack of trust in the now uh, in the Americans in the region, and uh, uh, the, their the policies are changing from one administration to another. Gary, you mentioned the carrier task group. And I think what struck me, and it's a question to you, what you've actually seen is a carrier task group whose capabilities in the attack role are now relatively limited compared to the land-based aircraft base that we have even in al Adade, where you've moved in B-52Hs and a deploying force of F-35s, essentially the carrier isn't going to perform the same role that it did in the past. The other thing that I think you have to say is that what you've had is a massive correction of funding and readiness, and in the capability of U.S. power projection forces, which will be is already beginning to be spent, that was seriously undermined and cut during the Obama administration, not by the administration, but by the Congress's budget ceilings. So regardless of what Trump says, the reality is that you have a radical increase in U.S. readiness and military capability funded, and that you're going to be seeing deploying over the next year and a half. And I just wonder how that would change your perception. Do I, understand you, do I understand you correctly, Tony, as saying that, that, there, that the capabilities are going to increase so rapidly that that will be 
uh, felt. Uh, I here. think you already have more than gapped the carrier. Your capabilities, and these are aircraft you can rapidly redeploy. So when you lose the mission requirement, and you have because you're no longer dealing with the caliphate, you really aren't going to necessarily use carriers the way you did no, no, five or ten years that. ago. But the other side is that, again, in terms of power projection capabilities, not necessarily here, an F-35 force, which you are now deploying, is just one of the elements of air capabilities that you can rapidly deploy. Holding hostages here to demonstrate things to people who don't know anything about the military strikes me as precisely the kind of waste of money you were pointing out in your paper. Okay. Dr. Abdurrahman, please. Thank you. Abdurrahman, I'm from the University of Kuwait. I'm speaking in English. Gary, I enjoyed your presentation, and as always, you've been wonderful. My question is, uh, Trump's doctrine is America first. Well, I don't know whether that's a doctrine or doctrineless. But frankly speaking, that doctrine is financial and economics is America first. But when it comes to the Middle East, politically, strategically, security-wise, it's Israel first, not America first. Thank you. Dr. Yusuf Tabgar. Thanks uh, for the informative presentation. And uh, my question is it, I mean, the, the change in the policy or is, is tightly linked to the change on the, on the need of the energy and oil, what do you call it, U.S. becoming a major producer of shell oil, which is make uh, the Gulf uh, less important. Uh, in terms of the uh, energy security and a lot of argument built on that. Gary, the floor is yours. Okay, um, that's a lot. Um, and I will do my best to uh, cover what I can. Um, with regard to um, where we should go as far as the GCC, um, I agree completely that uh, the GCC has been hurt very, very badly by this uh, isolation uh, that the Saudi Arabia and the UAE have adopted with regard to Qatar. And, uh, you know, the flight path of the aircraft I flew in on yesterday was affected very much by that, and so is everything else uh, around us. This is, a, this is a new fact of life. Um, I, I do believe that although, again, there's a presumption here that somehow the United States should solve the GCC problem. Um, you know, I don't think that's going to happen. I think that what President Trump has said, whether you like it or not, is that he has a different set of issues that, he's, that he is uh, pursuing. They, uh, you know, when the uh, initial uh, boycott of Qatar uh, began, uh, he thought it was a really good idea uh, because he had just been to Saudi Arabia, he had been uh, entertained very ra lavishly, and he thought that this was, this was the way he was going to go. He was quickly told that that wasn't quite the whole story, um, but he never quite, you know, Mr. Trump is a man who has a set of a few very basic ideas that he actually formulated for himself over the years that he was a, uh, a real estate uh, magnate in New York City. That's where he got all of his ideas. And he followed foreign policy. He's been very interested in foreign policy all the way through, but he, he never has had to test it in any way. The problem is that those ideas that were formed for him, which is basically that a government should run like a business. And that really is uh, very much the way he sees it, that if there isn't money coming in, that you're failing. And so that 
idea that it's, everything is measured by whether you're making a profit or not, it, which is fine from a businessman's point of view, is not a very accurate way of thinking. For instance, how do you buy security? From his point of view, you don't because the, somebody else should pay for that. If it's us that is affected only, then okay, it's, that's our defense. But anybody else that's facing a problem in the region is basically being told by Trump they have to solve it for themselves. And I think that although there are people of very good will and people who really do understand that policy, I don't see the United States intervening actively to try to solve the problem and create a problem for, for you know, to basically take care of the GCC problem. In the big historical overview that I gave, which was very spotty, uh, this was one of the points that I made, is that basically with the Clinton doctrine, we basically, the United States accepted responsibility for taking care of everybody's problems in the region. We, we formally, openly said, that we could do that and we would do that. And we kept doing that right through to the Obama period when we began to back away from that and Obama really defined a different policy. And as I argue again, I think President Trump has continued that policy only in a very somewhat different way. Uh, but it comes out to be the same and that is that the United States will look after its own interests and it's not going to come in and take care of something that they see as your interests. So you may have a problem in the region, but unless it directly involves US national security, you're probably not gonna get any help from Washington. I think that is the, the message that is there. And this could change in, in various ways. This obviously plays into the, uh, the fact that the United States is now the largest oil producer in the world. Uh, which was considered to be an impossibility only about 10 years ago. Uh, this is, has completely changed the geopolitics of the thing. I don't think it means that the United States thinks that it doesn't need the oil from the Middle East anymore. Uh, I hope not. Uh, it's pretty clear that, you know, that uh, the United States can't supply the oil for the world all by itself and that it does need this. Uh, on the other hand, if you are a rationalist, and you look at this very closely. For instance, in the Iran-Iraq war, there was fighting going on up and down the Gulf. Tankers were being attacked to the point where they wanted the United States to come in and protect them, and the price of oil stayed low. How do you explain that? The reality is everybody wants to sell their oil, and they want to sell their oil because they need to, not because it, they're, doing a, they're not doing the United States a favor by selling their oil, they're doing themselves a favor and they know it. They might oversell or they might undersell, the price of oil might go up or down, but the reality is that the countries here need to do that. And I think there's going to be a more realistic examination coming from Washington that says, you know, uh, we may not like everything that is going on in the region, but on the other hand, unless it affects us directly, we're simply not going to come in and engage ourselves. And I think this is a reality that uh, we've got now two presidents in a row, probably the two most different presidents in American history, but both of them saying essentially the same thing. And that is a, an issue that, and so that's the key point that I really wanted to make. The Israeli factor is always there. Uh, the United States had a fiction for many years that uh, it could separate our Israel policy from our Gulf policy, that the, the two had no relationship to each other at all. That was a fiction. It was made up. It was invented because it was convenient. But the reality was that uh, Israeli policy always affected U.S. policy in the region. Is that more so today than it has been in the past? Maybe. Uh, but not necessarily. Um, I mean, when you stop and think about 1973 and the, the United States, you know, deep uh, involvement uh, in supporting Israel in the course of that war and the Arab reaction to that, which was to institute an oil boycott, uh, you know, that was Israel being involved in the Gulf in a way that probably it never had been in the past. 
That's when, by the way, that fiction, if you could separate these two policies, that's when it died. That's when the fiction no longer uh, was, uh, nobody could say that with a straight face anymore. But the reality is that Israel has always been a part of what our U.S. foreign policy in the Gulf has been, but we tried to keep it compartmentalized. That, uh, that I think, is, is over. Today, it's a very different thing. Uh, you know, I remember vividly the Reagan administration when Al Haig first came in uh, to the Reagan administration and talking about foreign policy in the Gulf, his major proposition to the Gulf was, and to the Arabs in general, was, you know, don't worry about this Palestine thing. Uh, all of that issue, those are secondary issues. What you should really be afraid of, what you should really be thinking about is Russia. That's the real threat. And the, the fact is, from the United States' point of view, Russia was the real threat. That's where the threat came from. From the Arab point of view, there were other threats closer to home that were, in fact, more important. So he, basically, the Hague effort failed uh, to get all of the Arabs to get together with Israel to fight the Russians. That was his, his objective. In effect, President Trump's um, policy today is very similar, in the only it says the real threat you have to worry about is Iran and er nothing else counts. So don't worry about these Palestinians, don't worry about the issues that you thought uh, were very serious in the past, just get together and we'll all fight Iran and we can all agree on that. And in that way, Israel becomes a part of the region in a way that it never has in the past. Will that succeed? That's up to you. I don't know. Um, up until now, there has been more progress in that direction than I believe. On the other hand, we haven't seen the peace plan that is supposed to be the end of that game, uh, which is supposed to appear uh, and then solve the, the Palestinian issue. Um, I have a feeling that, that that game isn't over yet, but the reality is that it's there. So yes, Israel's there in the background. It always is. But to be brutally honest, the U.S. relationship with Israel is also undergoing a, an eva a reevaluation. The, certainly, President Trump and the people around him are absolutely committed to Israel in a way that perhaps no other American president has been. But for the rest of the body politic, except for the hard right in the United States, uh, the, cu curiously enough, the other people who are supporting that are the Christian evangelicals. Uh, so you have the, the, the Christians together with a hard line group of basically neocons who are coming up with one set of policies all based on Israel. And then you've got the rest of the country and just about everybody else who's saying, you know, they're not as impressed with Israel as they have been in the past. There is that uh, general movement. Uh, that is changing very slowly, but it is changing uh, seriously. It's not, uh, it's not nothing. So the, this is, all of these pieces are in motion. So the the relationship with Israel, its involvement in the region, and the degree to which Israel becomes an ally of the Arab states, or at least some of the Arab states, who in the, fa in the past have uh, rejected it, uh, is going to be very much a factor in how those issues play out. Um, to Tony's point, as, t as I understand it, that uh, naval issues uh, are not as important as they used to be, of course. I, I, I have no, no, no argument with that. Even though I'm a naval officer, was a naval officer a long time. In fact, my first, the reason I'm here is because uh, more than 50 years ago, when I was uh, just graduating from college with a naval ROTC scholarship, they told me that I was coming to the Persian Gulf. And um, at that point, I didn't even know where it was. So I had to go and look it up on a map. But I served out here in the naval force the, the, uh, for, uh, for about two years. And uh, I have never been able to get away from it ever since that time. So your first job sometimes can be a very important part of your life. Um, the, I think I've answered the question about you know, the Trump, America first, or is it Israel first? Uh, I've tried to answer that as well as I could, and also the issue about oil. So I'm, I'm not sure I gave everybody uh, as detailed an answer as you would have hoped, but uh, I did the best I could.
شكرا جزيلا جاري انا متاكد انه اجابتك ثانك يو جاري ام شور ذات يور انسرز ليد تو ايفن مور كويستشنز بات وي ستيل هاف تو دايز سو وي ويل هاف مور تايم فور اذر ديسكشنز اي ثينك وي هاف كوم تو ذا اند اوف ذيس ذا مورنينج سيشن ثانك يو فيري ماتش جاري فور ذيس برزنتيشن اي هاف تو هاوس كيبينج اناونسمنتس فيرست And now we will be uh, divided into two groups. Uh, the first group about uh, identity and uh, and second, uh, the thorium, and the other will be at the same uh, in, uh, in the uh, meeting room. And the second thing is there is a, an exhibition I ex uh, encourage you all to visit on the ground floor in this building that uh, gives an idea about Qatar. It's a beautiful uh, uh, pictures and photograph uh, exhibition. The, the first uh, session will begin at 10.30, exactly. That's where we have our two minutes of break. Thank you.